emotions, emotional problems, tension, anxiety, mental strain. These words seem to be very common. They're used much more today than they were 50 years ago because our daily life has changed very radically in those 50 years. Not so very long ago, life was relatively placid, tranquil and calm, no great emotional strain. Today, today we are living in the midst of the greatest social and technical change ever to take place in the history of mankind. The demands of our daily life put an emotional strain on all of us. Hurry, worry, deadlines to meet, bills to pay. When our minds become too preoccupied with too many of these problems, we can easily become the star performer in an accident. Here's an example of how easily emotional problems or worries could lead to an accident. Most of us have had this experience at one time or another. Sir, you just drove through a stop sign two blocks back. Me? I did? Yes, sir. That fellow in the black car hadn't been on the ball. You might have killed him. Yeah, I see your license and registration, please. I don't know why I did it. I've stopped at that sign a hundred times. I guess my mind just wasn't on my driving. I must have been thinking about something else. Right. He was thinking of something else. Perhaps married life isn't turning out right. His new wife isn't adjusting to army life. Or perhaps his wife is in the hospital with a complicated pregnancy. Could be his first child or his mother or father is seriously ill. Or it may be a financial problem. Perhaps a new boat and motor he wishes he hadn't bought now that he has unexpected overseas orders. These are the kinds of emotional problems we're concerned about. If that aviator had been flying with something on his mind, he could just as easily have failed to realize that his oil pressure was falling rapidly. But the distracting problems which cause accidents aren't always grim and unpleasant. I, I drove the first car I ever owned into a tree while daydreaming about an upcoming date with a blonde high school senior. But that was a lucky accident. I wasn't hurt seriously, and I learned a lifelong lesson. Don't daydream while driving or flying. In the files of the Army Board for Aviation Accident Research, there are a number of accidents which have been traced directly to emotional causes. Flight surgeons are the experts for the Army on the emotional aspects of accidents. Colonel Fisher is such an expert. Let's see what we can learn from him. Good morning, Major. Good morning, sir. We're interested in how emotional problems can cause accidents. That's an important subject for aviators. I thought you might review some of the cases we've had. Did you have any particular accident in mind? Yes, sir. I was going to ask about the case we were discussing last week. The accident in which Lieutenant Webster was killed in an OH-23. That's right, sir. It's an excellent example of emotional causes because it's one of the few cases we've been able to definitely nail down as positively caused by the distraction of an emotional upset. You see, accident investigators may suspect that an emotional disturbance is at least partially responsible for an accident, but rarely do they have sufficient proof to even mention it in their reports. In this investigation, we made a thorough study into the background of the aviator who was killed. We did this because of one fact which was agreed upon by all of the eyewitnesses. When his engine failed at an altitude of about 2,000 feet, Lieutenant Webster apparently did not take any emergency action. The aircraft lost rotor RPM, crashed, and burned. Why would an aviator do this? He must have panicked, just froze on the controls. Yes, but why? 
To try to learn why, we delved into Webster's background, his family, his personality, his problems. Webster was the youngest of seven brothers and sisters. He was the family favorite, and they were a warm, stable, and closely knit group. Webster was a very independent person. When he made a decision, he stuck to it, sometimes even after he'd been proven wrong. This stubbornness was probably the cause of Webster's first real problem. Webster was divorced several years before the accident but he stayed in contact with his former wife. He also made several attempts at reconciliation. And I have to get a few new things for David and Kathy. How are the kids, Martha? Oh, they're fine, Bill. I wish I could see them. Well, you can any time, Bill. You know that. I wish I could see you too, Martha. Bill, please give up. I told you the last time, no. Definitely no. Now, if you don't drop the subject, I'm going to hang up. Martha, I've learned my lesson. I'm a changed guy. Bill, you're just as bullheaded as you ever were, or you just wouldn't keep trying. The frustration of these rejections was difficult for Webster to take. And after each rejection, he burst out aggressively at anyone who disagreed with him. After several years of frustration, he found another girl. But the circumstances of his courtship took a heavy toll on his energy. The girl worked as an entertainer in a nightclub more than 60 miles from his post. Anything else? No, nothing else. Okay. Bill, I'm worried about you. You shouldn't be driving in every night to meet me. That's nice. Don't you want to see me? Sure, I want to see you. But when do you get any sleep? Sleep? I get four or five hours before I drive in every night. That's enough. I told you yesterday how we could solve the problem. Marry me, Debbie. Then I don't have to drive 120 miles every night to see you. Bill, I thought it all over like I said I would. Yeah. Well, I just wouldn't fit in. I'm used to theatrical life and excitement and coming and going as I please on my own. You'd forget all that. I know you would. Maybe you're right. Maybe I would. But I'm not ready to yet, Bill. I don't want to give it up. And you don't love me. I didn't say that, honey. We'll talk about it later. Who gets the sandwich? I do. Coffee. Apparently, Webster got himself into a new emotional problem. That's very often the case. You've noticed how trouble seems to breed more trouble? It really does. When you're under the strain of an emotional problem, you can't think clearly or have good judgment. You get into more trouble very easily. Was Webster on this four or five hour sleep routine at the time of the accident? Yes. Yes, he was. And he wasn't eating properly either. For example, on the day of the accident, he had neither breakfast nor lunch. It almost looks as if Webster was trying to hurt himself. As a matter of fact, that may be true. Suicide can't be ruled out as a possibility. Do you really think so, sir? Not premeditated suicide. We know his engine failed. But perhaps when the engine quit, he had an irresistible impulse. 
You might say that suddenly he saw an open door through which he could escape from all of the problems which had been plaguing him. I can see how that might be possible. Perhaps suicide never entered his conscious mind. But when the emergency arose, his confusion and panic were so great that he simply couldn't act to save himself. Well, what can be done about emotional problems, Colonel? How can we keep them from getting out of control? Probably the best remedy is ventilation. Ventilation, sir? Yes. Opening up and letting some air in. Talking to someone. Frustration, anger, and worry cause confusion. Confiding in someone generally brings relief from confusion. That's true. My wife and I have an agreement. If either of us is angry or worried about something, we talk it out before we go to bed. It's an excellent idea. Your wife is your partner. She has a right to know about anything that's gnawing at you. And there are three other people who have a direct responsibility for listening to your problems and to help with them. Your commanding officer, your chaplain, and your flight surgeon. So we all know that's true, sir. But the trouble is that a, a man like Webster, who really needs help, finds it very difficult to confide in anyone. You're right. And that brings up another factor. COs, chaplains, flight surgeons, and other aviators must learn to detect the signs of emotional disturbance and take action to prevent serious trouble. Let me tell you of another case where there were numerous opportunities to forestall a tragedy which killed an aviator. This young officer started to avoid his friends and was drinking much more than usual. He passed his annual physical, but his flight surgeon was aware of his drinking. He gave the aviator a lecture on the obvious fact that drinking and flying don't mix. But he did not ground him. His CO learned of his drinking and realized that his flying efficiency was falling off. He threatened him with a flying evaluation board. He did not ground him. Not long after this, he filed a VFR flight plan on a circular route to avoid severe weather. Two hours after takeoff, he crashed 40 miles from his circular route and on a direct route to his destination. Obviously, he had filed a circular route merely to obtain clearance. He flew a direct route in spite of weather warnings and terrain unsuitable for emergency landing. It's a shame he wasn't grounded. He's beyond grounding now, beyond all help. And no one even knows what it was that was tormenting him. Everyone with authority over aviators must realize that flying is a business that challenges your ego. Aviators can ground themselves, but they won't do it. If one of your men starts drinking too much, or is grossly depressed, or overly elated, ground him first, then lecture. If we can get that point across, we'll have come a long way. Well, thank you very much, sir. You've pretty well wrapped up the subject for us. We can sum it all up this way. As an aviator, you must realize that a serious emotional problem can be just as much of a hindrance to flying as a broken arm might be. Those you can turn to for help are members of your own team, all of them personally involved with your well-being. Your CO is responsible for your military capability. Your chaplain is responsible for your peace of mind and spiritual welfare. Your flight surgeon is responsible for your physical, 
and psychological well-being. These are the men you can unburden yourself to. Perhaps like the TV commercials, we should end with a slogan you can use when your mind's jamming up. Talk it out. Don't bottle it up.